Well, hello, everyone. I've got a question for you. Is it possible to succeed today in our climate of publishing as a Christian author? Well, I believe you can, and so does my guest today. Hi, my name is Eva Marie Everson. I am the CEO of Word Weavers International and the director of Florida Christian Writers Conference. And this is my good friend, Nick Harrison, who I've known for, oh my gosh, Nick, 20 years now. I was going <laughs> to say, yeah, at yeah. least. Yeah. yeah, I think I met you in 2003 at uh, at Mount Hermon. I think that's where we met. I might have met you before that. But be, I've been to the Florida conference, so it might have been there too. It it could have been there um, before before I took over the the, the directorship. But Nick wrote one of my absolute favorite books on prayer, called Magnificent Prayer, and it's a it's a book that I just return to over and over. I encourage you to check that out at Amazon or at his website. But today we're going to talk about his new release, and it is you can succeed as a Christian writer. So that answers our question right there, Nick. Thank you so much for joining us. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. What what made you want to write this book and at this time? Well, you know, several years ago, I was having dinner with uh, an industry professional. He had been in the industry for many years, and he said something that startled me. He said, Nick, I believe the best Christian books are yet to be, have yet to be written. Wow. And I thought, when I was thinking of, you know, all the wonderful authors that were currently in print and that are still in print, yeah. I've taken that statement of his to heart. And, and I still believe that's true. But we need to, we who have been writing and teaching writing, we need to be able to pass it forward, you know, to bring to fruition those writers who are going to write the best Christian books yet, mm -hmm. the future writers. And so it's a Writing the book was a way of encouraging uh, writers. Um, I know that you found this to be true. The community of Christian writers, whether you're together at a writer's conference or even, uh, you know, on a Zoom call, there's such a camaraderie mm -hmm. with other Christian writers. I mean, it's worth it for that alone. But when you add in the fact that we who write Christian books or articles uh, are influencing people, are, are helping people uh, recover from tragedy or find their place in life or whatever it is it's just it's the best life ever who it wouldn't is. Um, this? Yeah. one of the things i say about christian writers and especially within the, the christian writing community is that we are the only industry i know of who trains their competition we genuinely want others to succeed at this venture it's so important to us because it's not our work it's kingdom work Right. And that's the most important thing. Now, you know, I told you, I sent you a, a text or a, you know, I think maybe a text message or whatever. And I said, if I love a nonfiction book and I'm, and I'm not a huge nonfiction reader, but if I love a nonfiction book, I start marking it up. And, and I got to tell you, there's just, there's lines. I don't know if you can see that with the light, but there are just lines all over this book, the text of this book and, and notes in the margin. And I, and there's so many different, categories here that we could talk about. But one of the things that you do talk about is platform and platform seems to be an area that will stumble a new writer, a new Christian writer, especially. Let's talk about platform. How important is it and how can you develop a platform if you're not the CEO of a, cop of a corporation or you're not an actress or an yeah. actor or any of those things that would bring you recognition? Well, early on in the, in the new book, I, I talk about the importance of prayer and the life of the Christian writer, mm -hmm. believing that if you're called to be a writer, God will open doors for you. That does not mean we're ex excused from writing, from building a platform. We do need that. But there are ways to start small uh, and to build a platform as we go. Um, one of the ways that my the, the best example for me was when I was a new writer wanting to write books, wanting to help people, praying. And um, I was offered the opportunity to write uh, a devotional based on the WWJD bracelets that were oh. 20 some years ago. <laughs> yes. So my platform wasn't me. It was the current trend at that time of the bracelets. I also did a book uh, 
promises to keep daily devotions for men seeking integrity, which was based on promise keepers. Promise keepers so the, yeah. The, yeah, the platform wasn't me as a writer. It was me attaching myself to a current interest in the Christian community. Um, there are other ways. Uh, one way that it, it's almost humorous, uh, You've got to really be bold to do this. And I mentioned this fellow in my book. He goes door to door selling his books. He has yeah. 48,000 copies of his books by going door to door. That's not me. I'm not. Yeah, no, me either. <laughs> but um, where there's a will, there's a way. That's right. I, think, yeah. I talk about another author, Larry Duger, pastor of a. a yes. Large church yeah, I know Larry. Yeah. And he spent all of his advance <laughs> on promotion, uh, building his platform. Uh, th another way is to attach yourself to somebody who needs a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Duger also uh, was a fan of a, a program on the Discovery Channel. And mm -hmm. he just out of the blue wrote to them and said, you know, you need to turn what you're doing, your program into um, a, a book for right. hunters. Yeah, and yeah. They, they agreed. He did. We had a two book contract and um that was his platform. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I remember when that happened, he, uh, I ran into him at, uh, what was the last ICRS, uh, in Nashville. I was with Ramona Richards and it just happened to be walking down one of the aisles and I heard somebody call my name. I turned around, there was Larry and he had just signed that contract. He was so elated. He was like, he couldn't believe it happened, but it was just like you said, he just, he went for it. He had an idea and it might've felt pie in the sky, but he didn't let that stop him. He at least tried and he got it. Yes. He sent a copy of his latest book to one of the most influential TV evangelists out mm -hmm. there. And they praised his book up and down. They invited him to come on the rate of the TV show. Yeah. You just, you have to believe that if God calls you to write, he will also open doors for you that may Absolutely. seem closed down. Yes. And that, now, what about for fiction writers, though, Nick? Because, you know, prim primarily I'm a fiction writer. I do some nonfiction, but it's harder for fiction writers. It is. The best thing a fiction writer can do is simply write the best novel you can uh, and, you know, get feedback. Uh, be aware of what readers are wanting to buy. You know, we've talked for years about, will the Amish fiction yeah. ever, ever uh, <laughs> receive? Um, I don't think it's quite as popular as it used to be, but it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, I, I received, in my role as an agent now, I received a query from um, a fiction writer recently, like within the past two weeks, and um, wanting me to represent him. And so I was querying him and doing some questioning about his own writing career. Uh, and when I mentioned that Amish fiction had been big for the past mm -hmm. decade or two and still was flourishing, uh, he he had no idea. He he didn't realize that. And And part of what I want to convey in the book also is to help aspiring writers or or even growing writers to be aware of what's, what's happening uh, trend-wise in the industry. Mm -hmm. If you're writing fiction, you need to know what are the fiction bestsellers right now? What are fiction readers wanting to read? And write to that need if you can. I, yes. I don't encourage writers to uh, just write to the market for the writing to the market's sake. But if you can write your interest in a way that uh, intersects with what people want to read, you have a much greater chance of success. Absolutely. But there again, it's writing the best novel you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the best thing you can do. Have, do you think, and I, I know we used to talk about this, that Christian fiction kind of runs on the coattails of what we call ABA fiction or secular fiction, that whatever is really hot right now in secular fiction, about a year later, Christian fiction kind of catches up to it. Do you think that's true? Is that still a true well, statement? I've seen that a little bit, but you know, to be honest with you, uh, the, it's, there again, looking at the Amish fiction craze, that's something that started in CBA mm -hmm. and went over into the general market. Right. The general market is even looking at Amish fiction. So um, I think it can work both ways, but yeah. Um, well, uh, okay. So then on, on that note, let me ask you this question because you do talk about it in the book. What is happening with fiction right now? You, you know, I am also the director of the Sela Awards, and every year we get about 500 
titles in this office, which means I get about a thousand books uh -huh. <laughs> because we have, they have to send in two books. So about a thousand books come in here and we have to separate them and, and all of that. And, and we do notice that there are trends within fiction. And then there are, of course, the trend of, we have a year where there is a lot of fiction, not so much nonfiction. And then the following year, it may be absolutely the opposite. It may be a lot of nonfiction and a moderate amount of fiction. And I'll tell you that this year, romantic suspense, the romantic suspense category was nearly overwhelming. I couldn't believe the number of titles that came in under romantic suspense. Mm -hmm. And that's that's new to us as far as the numbers that it was this year. Yes, and you know, if you write romantic suspense, the concern would be you're up against a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. Or because there are so many people writing that, you better write a really stellar novel. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm finding that fiction is harder to place now than it was a decade mm -hmm. ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still there. People are still wanting to read fi good fiction. The genres of fiction I found to be are somewhat cyclical. A good example of that, in my opinion, is biblical fiction. Mm -hmm. There are years when biblical fiction is hot, then there are years where you just you can't sell a biblical novel, biblical based novel for anything. So um, I encourage writers to be aware of trends. Uh, uh, read the blogs of editors, other writers, uh, agents. Um, keep aware as best you can of, the, of what's going on in the industry. Now, a good agent will help you with that. And a good agent will be the filter will, will tell you, no, that genre is not popular right now but you need to do your own homework too you need to go you know if, just google christian bestsellers list and it'll take you to the ecpa mm -hmm. bestseller list uh and and know you need to know what's uh popular and what people are wanting to buy what's interesting to me is that some of the books on the bestseller list now are books that were on the bestseller list 10 years ago right I yeah. love languages. Yeah, uh, yeah. The perennial. Um, so yeah, you need to, uh, and it's a joy to do that. If you're called to be a writer, you will find that following tr trends, reading uh, blogs, and knowing what's on the bestseller list, it's fun. It's enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and it also will spark something inside of you. Like you'll think of a story that maybe has been running around in your head but you haven't really allowed yourself to sit down and develop the story. And then you'll see something that's like, hmm, that story, that's something I've been thinking about for a while or that type of story. And one of the things that you mentioned, and, and I've got to say this is, um, and then I wanna go back and talk a little bit more about biblical fiction, uh, but you talked about you know, where we get our ideas in the book. And uh, in the book, you talked about, I'm going to edit myself here. In the book, you talked about where we get our ideas as fiction writers. And one of the things you said was Dear Abby Col Columns and, and Dear Ann Landers and obituaries. And um, in fact, there are some such wonderful obits that I have read over the years that I have copied them. I, you know, just, I keep a little running file of them. They are, they're just they're just so wonderful. Um, but I mentioned to you that my work in progress that I just finished, I just hit the end and sent it to my freelance editor, is based on a Dear Abby that I read 40 years ago. And that was before I was a writer. But I, I always thought, wouldn't that make the best story? Wouldn't that just make the best story? And And I kept thinking about it and I kept building on it and adding to it until I had it, but I didn't try to write it before it's time. And I don't mean it's time within the publishing world. I mean, before I was ready to write it. Exactly. And I, yeah. I think that can be a problem sometimes for fiction writers. If they see a trend, they try to fit into a trend and they're not, that's not their calling or that's not what they're prepared to write at that time. Yep. I'm actually, I'm working on another book for writers right now, and in, in it's for fiction writers. And mm -hmm. I talk about, I have a whole chapter on what I call brooding, where you mm -hmm. have the idea, but you know it, it's not time yet for you to actually to hit the keyboard, but it's in your mind. It's mull, You're mulling it over. Things will, it's like, uh, then then you become like a magnet. You'll hear dialogue from somebody. You'll be in the airport, and you'll hear a snatch of a conversation, and you think, I'm going to use that. <laughs> 
that's how you build the story. And, and it takes time to do it right. And in your case, it took decades to happen. It did. Yeah. And in fact, you know, I, I remember sitting down with Steve Lobby at a, an old CBA convention, uh, or you know, that we had many, many, many years ago and, uh, and, and telling him that I had this idea for a story about twin sisters who were so, they were identical twins, but they were so polar opposite. And here's their story. And, da, 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 da. and we just, we kind of bounced around ideas. He was a, he was not an agent at that time. He was an editor at Bethany. And, and we just kind of batted around a few ideas. And then I, I never did anything with it. Well, guess what? Part of that idea went into the Dear Abby <laughs> story. So it, like I said, it was all this accumulation of things. And like you were saying, hearing little bits and pieces and just kind of throwing it into the quote filing cabinet of my mind until I was ready to sit down and, and actually get serious about, about writing it. Yeah. So let me go back to biblical fiction. And, and I'm, I just want to throw this out because I literally less than an hour ago signed a contract for a work of biblical fiction, believe it or not. And uh, I'm very excited about it. But when uh, my co-author and I, Miriam feinberg Vamosh, who is my dearest friend from Israel, when we first started shopping this, we were hit with that hard to sell biblical fiction, hard to sell biblical fiction notion. But I'm wondering like the, the house that picked it up were so quick and so excited. Um, they're actually going to try to get it out this year that I'm wondering how much of an effect the chosen is having on biblical fiction right now. That could very well be. You you never can can tell. Uh, it's like with going back again to the Amish fiction. If Beverly Lewis hadn't written, you know, uh, what was in my mind the uh, the book that launched that genre. Yeah. I, I mean, at the time, she probably could have been told by any number of publishers, nobody's reading Amish fiction. Right. <laughs> so she she basically started it. You know because of the chosen biblical fiction could rebound significantly. I yes. wouldn't be surprised at all. Yes. Well, and one of the things that, that I, uh, several people said to me, because this is definitely a departure from what I typically write, but uh, one of the things that I got about biblical fiction was, well, you're adding to the scriptures, but isn't that what all biblical fiction does? Because Otherwise, we just pull the words out of the Bible and copy and paste, right? Yes, and I think most readers get that. They know that to to tell the story, you do need to um, creatively, but accurately as possible, uh, you know, recreate scenes, recreate dialogue. I think that's a given among most uh, fiction uh, readers. Well, and and even fiction writers, we we think in terms of okay, this is this is what you saw or this is what you heard, observed, et cetera. Now let's go a little bit deeper. Who are these people? What was this all about, et cetera, et cetera? And, and kind of getting deeper into, you know, what is the bottom line and and whether or not the palm trees were swaying in the breeze. And, you know, the, the 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 scriptures don't necessarily tell us if it was a sunny day or not, but but we have to kind of fill in those blanks and fill in some of the blanks of the dialogue and get into the character of those biblical characters. So I'm hoping that the chosen is we're, we're going to see an up upswing in biblical fiction again, not just because I just signed a contract, but because I really do love that genre. So. Let's talk about what what publishers are looking for today. If it might be biblical fiction or something else, what are they looking for today? Well, with with fiction, I still think the, the best thing is a, a strong novel. But if I can talk about nonfiction, yes, please. please. Um, I think there will always be a market for what are called felt need books, books that address a felt need in the reader. Uh, I was talking uh, with um, a. a pastor who has a radio program and call in type program and he was telling me that uh right now he's getting an avalanche of callers mm -hmm. about depression depression unfortunately has become sort of an evergreen topic and it so when, when i'm talking about felt need books i'm talking about books like how to overcome depression how to be a good parent how to uh how to have a successful marriage how to manage your money these are all nonfiction books that address a felt need in a large number of readers i, I think there will always be a demand for those um, 
one author that I remember from years ago uh, did not have a platform at all, but he had a great idea for a book on reducing blood sugar, mm. blood sugar, and wrote that book. And it, it made its way to the rack market. Now, the rack market are those spinner market uh, racks you see <laughs> yeah. in stores and market stores. And it was a, it was a bestseller. So, uh, so writing to the needs of a large segment of the population is always going to be a winner. And, and all the more so. I mean, you really need to have the credibility to do that. Now, the, the, the person that I was speaking about with the radio uh, broadcast, he actually had a ministry that could help uh, depressed people. So if he were to write about this, he would have the credentials for it. So you just can't pick a, a topic and say, oh, I'll write about that. You need to have some credibility because as, and as I mentioned in a chapter in the book on uh, the, cha the chapters on book proposals, you need to be able to convince in your book proposal an acquisitions committee at the publishing house that you are the person to write this book. No matter how great the need is or how good a writer you are, you've got to be able to be credible, a credible source for the potential reader. And you do talk about that in the book, about what happens at an acquisitions meeting and why it's not just a matter of selling it to an acquisitions editor, you know, that, an, that you go to a writer's conference and you sit down with an acquisitions editor and they're like, I just love this. Or even an agent who just absolutely loves this. Then they have to sell it to an entire team. And that team, I, I remember, I believe it was Steve Lobby again. I remember him saying to me, uh, pretty much the job of that team is to say no. And, you, you know, the acquisitions editor's job is to figure out how to get them to say yes. Yeah, and part different. of that is you wrote a good proposal. The most painful thing in, in my mind for any editor, acquisitions editor, is to take a, a proposal that he really, he or she really champions to the committee and have it turned down, because that's the end of the line. At least with an agent, if yeah. you fall in love with a project and, and and an author, you can take it elsewhere. But for an editor to have a, a prize project turned down is very painful. Oh gosh. Yeah. Uh, well, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, writers conferences and, and we'll end with this because we could, we could talk about this business for hours. Um, I, could. <laughs> I know, I know I could too. I definitely could. I, I love this industry so much and, and it's so important to me and, and I know how important it is to you. One of the things I say, I don't know how many times a day, a week, a month, get yourself to a writer's conference, get yourself to a good writer's conference. So let's talk about the Christian writer's conferences that can be found not over, not only just all over the world, but specifically here in the United States. Yeah, there are several and they're all good. The, you meet editors, you meet agents, you meet other writers, you hear their stories of success or failure, and you you become part of that uh, camaraderie I was talking about. You, you learn... For one thing, you learn to network. I know yes. of authors who probably would have gotten a no on their project, except they had actually met with an editor or an agent and established a rapport. And so the so when the proposal came in, the editor or the agent got it. They knew from having met with the author what it was all about. And that gave impetus to them as they presented it to the acquisitions committee, when otherwise they might have gotten a no. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I love writers conferences just for the uh, camaraderie, but also yeah. the workshops you- The workshops, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, yeah, it's wonderful. And then so, there's, uh, you know, oh, keynote not... speakers and, and praise and worship, which is of course at a Christian oh, writers right. conference. If, if you want to experience something different, go to a non-Christian writers conference. Sometimes, And that's the, what, what I was talking about earlier. I have been to those conferences as faculty and the competition attitude is so fierce. And yet- and I'm not, I'm not discrediting them. It's just, it's a different attitude oh. where at a Christian writers conference, honestly, I've seen this so many times, you know, like I don't have what you're looking for, but I was just talking to a woman over here who has exactly what you're looking for. And then they go and pull that person over and, and let, they'll give up their 15 minutes because that's what we do. Yeah. I've, I've experienced that too. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I don't want to really want to go to any more secular conferences. No, me either. I, yeah. I've, yeah, I've done I've done my fill of of you know and and during the 
like little parties or whatever, vampires and witches and, <laughs> and all these uh -huh. kinds of crazy things that go on. But you're also right in that my first, the first time I met an acquisitions editor, I was at, I was at CBA. I was at the international convention. And this was back in the day when you could sit down with acquisitions editors on the floor. I, somebody just happened to walk by a friend of mine, took a photo of myself and this acquisitions editor that I was speaking to. And I'm so glad because it's now framed and it's here in my office. But nine days later, that acquisitions editor called me and offered me a contract. And it was with Barber Publishing, a very reputable house in our industry. But it was be not because I had just sent something in through an email or snail mail, but because of that meeting. And we connected as two women, two individuals, uh, you know, two people who love the Lord. We just connected. And that's what was so important. And again, like you said, you you never know at a Christian Writers Conference when those, I call them God incidences happen. Yeah, divine appointments. Divine appointments. Yes. You know, you're just sitting, you're just waiting. Somebody sits down next to you. Uh, we have a, a Word Weavers member who got a three book deal uh, at the 2021 Florida conference because she was just sitting down and someone came and sat down next to her and started talking to her, happened to be an acquisitions editor. And she had not made an appointment to meet with her. So, yeah, you know, those things happen. Know. I tell writers that, you know, that sometimes the objection will come, well, I can't really afford to go. I encourage, I say, hold a bake sale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I saw that. Or, you know, ask your church if they will help support your ministry by sending Absolutely. you to a writer's conference. Go, just go. Yeah. And some people use their tax money. And, and you know, this is why as the director of a conference, I say to my faculty, these people have laid it all on the line financially and with their time to sit down in front of you, please give them that attention. Uh, because seriously, whatever it takes to get you there, get to a conference. And most conferences have scholarships. Mm -hmm. So look for those. And, and, and at Word Weavers International, our individual chapters give out scholarships to conferences. So at, if you're a Word Weavers member, ask your president if you want to go to a particular conference, find out if there is money in your bank account for that. And then they will contact me and we'll, we'll get you there. We'll do everything we can to get you there. Nick, thank you so much for joining me today. Again, this is the book. You can succeed as a Christian writer. Nick, it's at Amazon, all the different places, your website. Tell me where, tell us where we can find it. Well, Amazon's the place to go. This book I self-published through Amazon and they've done a great job. You yes. know, that's another thing people should look into is, and I address this in the book is the idea of self-publishing to give yourself mm -hmm. a jump start. Just know that if you self-publish, you're still going to have to do the marketing. That's right. <laughs> have to promote the book. But self-publishing is, is still a very viable option. Yes. Just make sure you have your work edited because oh. that's, Definitely something we're seeing a lot of self-published books. And and you mentioned this in the book. I'm going to have to go back to the book now. You mentioned this in the book. Please don't tell us that God told you to write it exactly like this and don't change a single word because that's a death sentence in so many ways. It is. It is. Yeah. I, I, I saw a self-published book at a conference and I, I picked it up. And on the first page, there were three major errors mm -hmm. on the first mm -hmm. page. Yeah. So yes, having it professionally edited is an extreme it's critical. Error. Yes. And don't, and don't think that, that that means somebody you know down the street who used to be an English teacher exactly. because the, your seventh grade English teacher or your seventh grade grammar teacher, that's a totally different ball game than editing within the publishing industry. There are rules and then there are styles and et cetera. And you need to find someone who knows how to do that. This year with the Sela Awards for the first time, we really cracked down on the editing portion of the, the judging sheets. And boy, did that make a difference because we were starting to see more and more self-published books come in with more and more editing issues. And so, you know, it, it was a well-crafted book. It was well, you know, well-written. It was a great idea, but it was horribly edited. And unfortunately that makes a difference. It does. Yeah. Thank you again for joining us. Hello everyone. Again, if you want to know more about Word Weavers International, it's word-weavers.com. We welcome you to come and check us out. If you don't know who we are, 
we are a community of writers who are iron sharpening iron. We want to support each other along this writing journey. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you again, Nick. And, Thanks for having uh, me. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you next time, everybody.